Believe it or not, the Grug showed up. <laughs> the Grug man. What's up, bro? How's things been, man? Been ages since we last spoke. Grug, are you there? Yeah. <laughs> there is. There's the Grug man. Dude, can you hear us? I guess not. <laughs> Uh, we seem to be having a little bit of technical difficulties with the Grug, so just give us a couple of seconds. Uh, for you guys who don't know who the Grug is, please follow him on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash at the Grug. Uh, he's been around since forever, basically. He's one of the like, Hello, upset guys. Hey, bro, you're there. We're getting some audio in. <laughs> okay, so I think Grug's on a call. You did turn on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think Grug's already some food, so we'll just give him <laughs> a few <laughs> minutes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so for you guys who don't know who the Grug is, right, he's like one of the leading upset guys. He's been speaking at Hang in the Box for like, I don't know, over a decade, probably 15 years or something like that. He was one of the original creators of the fisting technique of like, you know, hiding data in file systems. Uh, He's been around, man. Uh, Grug, are you with us, bro? Have you done order? Have you done? Are you done with your food order? <laughs> I think <laughs> Grug still can't hear us for some reason. One second, I'm gonna tweet him. Hopefully that works. <laughs> uh, Grug, Grug, Grug. Hello, hello, Grug, can you hear us? <laughs> I think Grug can't hear us at all. I really don't know why. So weird. You know these gremlins of live stream, right? They always crop up when you least you expect it. I don't know whether no, he, he can does. even he, see us. He just, he just put his hands up. But he can't hello? hear us. Yeah, can you hear us? Hey. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. How are you, man? Oh, uh, good, man. How are you? Yeah, good, good brother. I've been ages, man. It's been a while, man. Yeah, I've been uh, too long. The, man. The, this whole thing, it's like what? It just added like two years all of a sudden since uh, this, this pandemic is like screwed up time crazy. Yeah, man. I, I can't believe it's been two it? years, bro. Like, we haven't left or uh, gone anywhere. Uh, We've been sitting at home. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, how's Singapore? How's Singapore? Well, we're in actually in Malaysia, so we're sitting in the studio in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I think Singapore is fine. I think it's okay. They're doing a lot better in Malaysia. Yeah, at least in uh, COVID Singapore numbers, then? they're doing a lot yeah. better. Yeah, COVID <laughs> numbers, they're doing a lot better. Uh, yeah, yeah, here things are not so great, man. Like the number is like 20 something thousand cases per day. Uh, you know. Yeah. It's just madness. It's Same mad. over here. You're still in Thailand, it's not right? Good. Yeah, still, still in Bangkok. Still in Bangkok, so, yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. I yeah. think over here is over there. But uh, how's the vaccine vaccines. drives and stuff going? <laughs> I mean, like, at least are they, they're running out vaccines and stuff already, right? Yeah, like, um, uh, like it, it's a politically sensitive topic. You're not supposed to <laughs> talk about it, but. Uh, it, 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 like a lot of the companies have failed to come through on their promises that the government made. Okay. <laughs> Sounds familiar. So, uh, Sounds familiar, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah what, you know how it is. What have you been re researching, man? I mean, since you've been stuck at home, right? Like, what, what have you been doing to keep oh, yourself man. busy, so, man? I've, uh, so I've been, I've been doing like quite a lot of, um, just like pure cyber theory stuff and, um, a lot more sort of just on like, uh, how states interact with each other, um, like the, like cyber conflict, like, uh, war that is below the threshold of armed conflict, like things that are now a lot more interesting to me than, um, like technical things is sort of, how cyber can be used to manipulate states and make them do things. And also, um, because like the, the way that the world exists right now is states are not actually the only or even necessarily the dominant power. So a lot of the time, what's interesting is not necessarily manipulating states, but manipulating, uh, companies. So, um, 
Like one excellent example would be the, uh, the North Koreans when they attacked Sony in 2014. They weren't trying to make the U.S. ban um, movies about North Korea, right? Like it, it wasn't an attempt to make uh, the U.S. do censorship, but it was an attempt to make film companies avoid uh, doing things that would upset North Korea. And it has been successful, right? Um, there haven't been any any new movies <laughs> from uh, North Korea. So, you know, it, it, like it's quite interesting that you can you can target things other than nation states and achieve objectives that match with your strategic goals. So this I find very, very interesting. I think it's um, something that's not dealt with enough. Like there's not a lot of... Um, People aren't really looking at it enough. Um, the other thing I've been doing is trying to sort of demonstrate how a lot of the things that we just sort of see regularly are actually strategic. Um, for example, uh, ransomware is like people like to look at it simply through the uh, the rubric of cybercrime mm -hmm. and how it's a criminal act. But that's like that sort of that would be sort of like treating piracy as theft. Like pirates just rob when that's not necessarily true. Like uh, privateers would rob and give money to the state. Therefore, the state sponsored them because it was part of their strategic objectives. Similarly, um, ransomware is in alignment with the strategic objectives of uh, certain states. So it's done within the uh, rubric of a grand strategy, a way of achieving um, goals for that state. So, anyway, um, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> if, staying busy, I, I basically. Staying busy, yeah? yeah, doing obsex stuff as always. But when you talk about threat actors, right? I mean, I'm guessing like Russia is always top on everybody's uh, radar, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like Russia, obviously they do a lot. But, um, God, you reminded me. Like, yeah, so I've also been doing obsex stuff. So, like, one, like one thing I've been doing recently is I've been trying to take... Um, the Comsec stuff that I did a long time ago and mm -hmm. make that available to people. So, uh, communication security, um, sort of like basically how, how to be secure when you talk to people, um, and more than just encrypting everything. So, yeah, like Com Comsec has been one of the other things I've been working on. Um, I've got a lot of that, um, sort of down on paper, which turned out to be a bad thing because <laughs> now I have to take it off of paper and put it onto a computer and <laughs> you still use paper bro what the hell <laughs> 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 hey so, weren't you building a secure sure phone it was at one very time? insightful but um yeah so yeah sorry comsec but uh, like yeah Russia is a big deal but you know even like even the way we talk about um cybercrime actors versus like APT or state actors I think we sort of fail to recognize important things. So, for example, um, you know, people go like, oh, it's financially motivated. It's like, motherfucker, you know, <laughs> like the entire world is financially motivated. Like, how shit. the fuck do you think capitalism works? <laughs> right? Like when, when we did state directed stuff, we got fucking communism and it fell apart. Right? When you have like money directed, like financially motivated <laughs> markets and financially motivated countries, you win the Cold War. So, you know, I don't think it's really a great idea to make fun of them just because they want to make money. Money <laughs> is a very good way of allocating resources and motivating people to do things. Uh, I mean, <laughs> like everything we have is basically built because of money. Like, what the fuck? It's not like it's not like just because it's it's like not as pure as like ideals. It doesn't mean that it's not an effective way of getting people to do things. Mm, most that. Hey, but talking about secure comms, right? Weren't you working on like a private phone mm. or a secure phone or something? Like a hardware device? Yeah, some yeah. Time ago? Yeah, for quite a while. But um, I think maybe the market has changed now. But back then, see, like the, the, the big trouble is that you, you either make something that people can afford... And then, um, in order to get to that, you need to have like investment. You have to, you know, sell millions of devices mm -hmm. or you have something that, um, a select few people can afford, but then you have to find a way to get people to spend $5,000 on a phone. And, you know, like people want to spend 500 bucks on a phone and people don't want to spend 5,000. But if you're, you know, if you're selling a phone for 500 bucks, 
and you sell like 20 of them in a year. Yeah. You can't run a company on that. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know? yeah. 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 So you have to go the other way. And it's, it's quite hard to do. Um, so yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, I, I gave up on that, but I might take some of the stuff I did and make it available for free because, uh, otherwise it's just sort of gathering bit rock. So, I mean, if you're talking about upside for like just general people, right? As in like security researchers that have, you know, exploits or whatever, yeah, yeah. right? Like, what would your suggestions be? Like, unplug from the internet and like, throw your laptop somewhere uh, no, else? No, no, man. Uh, I mean, yeah, like, okay. So, uh, first of all, a, um, a modern Android phone, like AOSP, you know, just a, a mm-hmm. clear vanilla with no Google stuff. Um, if you can get Graphene OS on a modern Google device, that's great. If you can't, you can use AOSP, you know, compile it yourself. Don't pull it off of um, a forum or something like that because it's usually badly put together. Anyway, like that is very, very secure. It's going to be more secure than your laptop, hmm. generally speaking. So that's like, that's step one, but like step two, well, okay, actually step one is you need to have more than one device. So, uh, my, my rule of thumb is, uh, one device per vice. Wow. So. (laughs) (laughs) It can be expensive, bro. That can end up to be quite expensive, man. (laughs) You know, be selective in your vices, I guess. <laughs> the thing is, um, what you want to do is you want to minimize the impact of a problem. So if you have your personal device that's got, you know, like your bank and your, um, your regular email and all your stuff like that, you don't want that to be compromised and then impact your work stuff. Mm-hmm. But similarly, you don't want to compromise on your work to then impact, you know, your life. So you need to at least have a separation and you need to make sure that you don't mix and match things between them. And that's simply because um, you assume at least one of them is going to be compromised mm-hmm. and you want to make sure that whatever is sort of compromised and stolen from there doesn't impact the rest of your stuff. Wouldn't, so, it, be, um, you know, wouldn't it be better to just so assume uh, that you're compromised anyway and then act accordingly? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't do anything bad. It's one way of doing it, but (laughs) both now and um, if things change in the future, don't do anything that might be considered bad (laughs) at some point in time in the future. So uh, it's very easy; just be uh, perfectly predictable and vanilla. But um, you know, like the (laughs) the thing with OPSEC is like there's three C's, which is uh, cover, concealment, and compartmentation. So. Uh, cover means that uh, what you're doing has a plausible and legitimate reason behind it. So if someone looks at, you know, why you're sending encrypted communications to someone, it should be because talking with them is not weird. Right? Mm. Like you, you shouldn't be sending encrypted communications to like the Russian embassy. That's going to stand out. But, you know, sending encrypted communications to someone who is, you know, a friend, that's reasonable. So the next one is concealment. So you want to have it, um, it, it's hidden so that the, uh, like overt view, like if someone just looks at it, it's not going to be immediately apparent that it's something dodgy or sneaky. So cover, make sure that it's got a plausible explanation and a legal or legitimate explanation. Uh, concealment, make sure that people can't really see it. And then compartmentation, just to have, um, as I said, you know, like, one device per vice. It's basically to make sure that the um, the things that you're doing don't interact with each other and they don't have links to each other. So uh, if you have a, a secret email account, don't forward those emails to your regular account and don't forward your regular emails to that account. Um, that was actually one of the ways that a... Um, a guy got busted in the US was that he, he set up a secret email for um, talking with a reporter. And then because he wanted to access it at work, he had his work and that one both forwarding to each other so that um, when the, like basically when they investigated his work and they found that like, oh yeah, like he's got all these like fucking, you know, don't secret so-and-so at yahoo.com. Let's go and look at that. And, you know, they found everything there. So because he he hadn't compartmented because it was, um, you know, hopelessly intermixed, he was exposed. So, you know, it's cover, concealment, and compartmentation, the three C's. 
How, how do you keep track of which device you use for each device? Do you like write it down somewhere? The red phone is for this. The black phone, um, the pawn yeah, phone, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ordering stuff so, on the internet phone. <laughs> yeah, no, it, like it's it's difficult. Like the way the way I did it when I had like more than two. Like two, it's easy. You've got work and you've got personal. That's not a big problem. But um, I had a like I had drawers, so I would have like one drawer would be focused on the thing, and then I could just put each device in the correct place and remember what's what. So that's um, like that's what I used to do. But it, it, like it's fucking hard. Like every every phone is just like it's a black rectangle. They all look the same, you know. And then uh, <laughs> if you don't remember to put it in the exact same space, then like. Two weeks later, when you need it again, you're not sure which is which. <laughs> it's not fun. Um, you know, you could label things. Uh, like I, at one point, I tried to do that, like nail polish. I wanted to get uh, just the primary colors, like red, uh, blue, yellow. Right. So um, I also don't know how to buy nail polish. I've got no idea where it is or whatever. So I, I asked a friend, like, so I said to this girl, like. Here's some money. Can you like get me some nail polish? And she came back with like three shades of green and like I said, <laughs> I need like red, blue, and yellow. And she came back and she said, these will look better on you. <laughs> I'm sick with style, bro. I'm sick with style. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, now I have to remember which of three shades of fucking green is the right shade. Like, <laughs> So what, what yeah, about um, offset when you're traveling, bro? I mean, like you know, if you're having to cross borders, right? That's a whole different ball game already, right? How do you how do you ensure yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the the way uh, like the way to cross borders is to just basically uh, what's called um, traveling naked. So naked means that you don't have anything compromising on you at all. Okay. So you have a device that's got nothing problematic. It's completely clean. So. You assume that you're going to get, you know, investigated. You're going to have your stuff copied. People are going to look at it. But because there's nothing there, it doesn't matter. Once you've passed that checkpoint, you know, once you've gone to your hotel and so on, that's when you can start acquiring the things that you need. So um, if you're truly traveling naked, you wouldn't purchase a device until you're in the country. Right. Um, because... You know, like that's, that's the correct way to do it. Uh, that's very expensive. Um, the, the other way you can do it is if you have all of your stuff on the cloud, mm. right? So like the, like there's, there's one way to do it with an iPhone, which is, it's quite painful, but basically you set your iPhone up, you create some, like you do all your stuff, you have it backed up to iCloud, mm -hmm. then you set it up as a different device. And have that not backed up to iCloud. Ah, uh, okay. Right. Okay, okay, got then, it. Then, <laughs> right. So you set that up. It's clean. It looks nice. It's got all the, you know, nothing compromising on it. Once you've crossed the border, you then reset and you do a re-image off of your iCloud, at which point you now have your real phone again. That makes and sense. then, you know, you do the same thing. What about like, I mean, how concerned should so we be about you... like stingrays and, you know, that kind of stuff as in like interception, right? That's happening like, you know, on site at your hotel, yeah, for example, then... they compromise the access points and those kind of things. Really, like it's not a, a realistic threat, I think, for most people. Um, like the, the technology is out there, it's used, but, you know, People don't use GSM or 3G that much. It's all uh, 4G and 5G these days. They're a lot, like they're a lot safer. They're not actually safe, but they're a lot better than um, it used to be. And it's sort of, it's fairly unlikely that they'll be able to do anything other than pinpoint your exact location, which, you know, that's a problem, but that's a, a different set of concerns than uh, device security. Hmm. Right. So if you want like location security and you have a phone, um, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. like it, it depends on what you're trying to do. Like I, I think the, the number one OPSEC thing I would say is, um, follow like the, the OPSEC plan, the five step OPSEC plan, which is what are you trying to protect? Um, who are you trying to protect it from? Like what's the worst that can happen? 
um, then how sort of do you, like who you're protecting it from and the worst that can happen, order it so that like the, the worst thing is protected before like the least worst thing, you know, just mm -hmm. prioritize and all that. Then come up with a, a way of doing that protection and then actually do it. So, you know, figure out what you're trying to do and figure out what goes wrong so you can prior, you can prioritize it, figure out who you're trying to protect against. So you know what, um, the threats are that you're facing. And then, you know, you can go ahead and do it. If you just go out and say, like, what can I protect against and figure out different things, you won't get anywhere because it's meaningless, you know? Um, it's important to actually know, uh, like, why you're doing things and then choose things that uh, help you achieve your objectives. Are you still doing any work with anti-forensics? Because you were one of the pioneers for anti-forensic <laughs> techniques, right? Yeah. So... One of, one of the interesting things now is um, I'm sort of I'm returning to my anti forensic stuff because I've been I've been talking to people in um, they've been researching malware and APTs and they're like oh yeah now everyone's doing like living off the land it's really difficult and you know everyone uses Cobalt Strike it's really difficult I'm like I, I, I this is anti forensics I did this like 20 years ago I explained how like all of this works and why and everything and so um, like the the foundation the foundational theories I came up with of you know like uh, reducing the amount of information you leave behind and the ways to go about doing it and all that. All of those things are now actually being implemented, you know, 20 years later. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I've been returning to that and I want to, um, sort of re, rewrite it for the, the modern, um, like the modern set of threats that we face. Cause I don't think uh, Linux file systems are as critical as um, you know, understanding sort of why uh, threat actors will operate in certain ways and where they're likely to go. So yeah, like the, a lot of the anti forensic stuff is that was sort of very very novel back then is now absolutely standard. But even more so, the theories behind why to do it, like the the concepts that were being implemented and the foundations for why to do things. You know, mm -hmm. like staying in memory. Yeah. You know, that's standard now, right? Um, to make sure that there is, you know, nothing left behind that can be used, like just encryption everywhere, um, to make sure that things get deleted properly, to make sure that there aren't like artifacts and that if there are artifacts that they're um, not uniquely tied to a specific actor, to use generic things, to um, have sort of very, very short durations of operation because those are the times when you're sort of at, at peak vulnerability. So you'd have things like your, um, your actual implant would not do very much. You know, it would accept, say, a Python script and execute that. And so what you would actually do when you're doing your attack is you'd be sending on, or like when you'd be going hands on and you'd interact with the thing, you'd send the Python script that does what you want to do. Right. And then when it's done, it gets deleted so that Unless someone captured that exact snapshot, they'll have no idea, you know, what your objectives are because you won't leave that information behind. So, you know, these these things are now becoming more and more standard. But it's, you know, um, as far as I can tell, people are viewing this as a uh, like it's some sort of evolution and progression as things are getting more and more complex. But it's not. It's just, you know, like we we know why they're going to do it and where they're going to go. But people are surprised by it because they haven't thought about it from the point of view of um, the security of those sorts of operations. Like that aspect of security gets ignored. Um, at my point, like back when I was doing it, it was about forensics analysis. Now it's about uh, incident response. But it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's still a part of security and attacking that part is still something we need to think about. Yeah, I mean, even when you talk Although about I detection, actually thought about it all already, so you guys don't need to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even when you talk about incident response and detection, right? Like a lot of the threat actors probably yeah. aren't using such advanced techniques, but people are still finding it only after like months, years later. You know what I mean? Is then the threat actors yeah, have been yeah. there forever, and it's only because you know exactly. by some way out means that they discovered it. You know, but they were in the system for a very long time, and they didn't need these advanced techniques in order to hide themselves. Right? They were hiding in plain sight, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Exactly. I, I guess. And, I mean, there's like that was another thing I, I looked at at one point is that um, basically uh, time is a factor in offensive operations, and 
sort of one thing that comes up is that if you know if you're a threat actor, if you if you give the defender infinite time, they're going to detect you because your your you know like your security just degrades over time. That's the way it is. But um, if you don't give them infinite time, then you know things switch. You you can if you can reduce the amount of time that they have to find you, then um, you know they have to be lucky as opposed to um, you know you being unlucky, or whatever. It, so like <sighs> there's a lot of very interesting things that could happen, which I think don't happen just because um, threat actors are not as sophisticated as they should be. Yeah, you know, I think <laughs> particularly the ones that we see getting written up, they're you know, I mean, they're, they're the ones that get caught. You know, uh, the the ones that are really good that don't get caught, we don't see as much written about them, and they they're a lot more interesting in the techniques they use, um, sort of the, the theories that they're applying. Those are a lot more interesting overall. Have you seen any new? Have you observed any new and novel techniques um, in terms of anti forensics? Because you've been doing this a long time. Something. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like the one that I found, um, it's called uh, gargoyle, and it turns out it's like I only found out about it recently, but it came out a couple of years ago. Um, basically, what it does is it um, when it executes, it does it in a region of memory that's marked, you know, like mm-hmm. execute whatever. Before it stops execution, it creates this like little rock gadget thing, which um, it will, basically, it turns the memory region that it's in Mm non-executable, returns, does some regular stuff, and then when the um, the process, like when that part gets run again, it goes and it executes this ROP gadget, which then makes that region of memory executable, continues in there, and then before stopping it, you know, makes itself non-executable and sets up this ROP gadget again. And what that ends up doing is um, a lot of memory forensics tools copy out executable regions of memory. Mm-hmm. So they'll grab a process and they'll pull all of the executable stuff because the data is just going to be huge. So they look at the executable stuff. And with this approach, you know, you won't be in executable memory except for short periods of time. So I found that very interesting, you know, uh, moving, moving to being um, sort of not just stealthed in um, by running only a memory, but to actually only sometimes run a memory and most of the time not. And um, there's, there's been other things as well, like uh, there's, there's really fast process migration. So you'll have your code that sort of skips from process to process to process so that any sort of like any snapshot in time is unlikely to capture your code executing in the process that you've infected. So, you know, things are getting... Very, very interesting there, and um, I think it's quite cool. I, I doubt that it's necessary that that often, um, but you know, I, I've been impressed that there is actually like there's advancements being made that people are doing this research. They're they're developing new techniques and they're making it work and releasing code for it, and I think that's quite cool. What about like you know um, uh, you know folks moving to actually poison the sauce? As in you know if you take over the <laughs> the sauce stream of a product and you can insert your own stuff into it, right? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like the upstream stuff. So yeah, like I don't know. I, so I I tend to think that like anything that leaves data behind is bad, even if um, it's sort of deeply buried. So. Uh, like again, it depends like what you're trying to do and what your risk budget is and so on. But you know, personally, um, like I find some of those attacks interesting. You know, like you might remember 20, 20 years ago, the Linux kernel got compromised um, at the source code level mm-hmm. uh, from uh, kernel.org, and uh, you know, I've, I've managed to get the the history on that from both sides. So I, I've gotten uh, a record of what happened from the person who did it, mm-hmm. but I've also spoken to the um, the sysadmins and the people who were doing security at the time about how it occurred. And it's a really interesting story. And the way that it got caught is uh, like it's pure chance. Um, basically, the, the account of one person who had git commit privileges was compromised. Mm-hmm. So his box was compromised. And the source code was altered there and pushed in. But 
he had a, uh, a bad connection, and some of his get pushes had failed. Okay. So what he did was he had this he had the script that ran every night. It would download a fresh copy from like kernel.org, and then it would do an MD5 comparison of his source code right. to this one that was downloaded, and to see you know like if basically if what had been uploaded was corrupted from what he had locally. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was detected, was that wow. what was uploaded did not match what he had. So initially, it was just a like, oh, okay, you know, my, my, my crappy connection, you know, caused corrupted files again. And then, you know, looking at it, he could see the actual, um, the actual problems. So that was quite interesting. But like speaking to the person who did it, for them, it was like a fun thing they did when they were young. <laughs> speaking to the, like, speaking to the sysadmins, they're still angry about it. Like this is twenty years later. Like um, when, like when I asked one guy, he was like, "Oh yeah, that wasn't around, like I wasn't around for that." Like let me talk to the people who were there at the time. And the one guy was like, "That didn't happen." Like, he only got access to like he only got access to one account. The whole thing was fine. We had to like rebuild everything, but it was all clean. I was like, Man, like <laughs> okay, relax. <laughs> yeah, this was twenty years ago. No one fucking. No one's blaming you for getting hacked back then. Even though, like, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, like, bro, I think really we're angry about it. <laughs> I think we're almost out of time, or if not, I think we're actually over time already. Oh, yeah. But, uh, hey, thanks so much for joining us, bro. I mean, like, pity we yeah. couldn't catch up in person, but uh, soon, hopefully soon, man. Hopefully yeah, soon, soon, right? Uh, yeah. Well, anyway. Good to speak to you, man. We Take care, brother. <clears throat> See you soon, man. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Ciao, Thank man. You.